What's going on, everybody? Welcome to my extended discussion of Ready Player Two by Ernest Klein. I just want to say up front that if you haven't read Ready Player Two yet, I do go into some spoilery type things in order to talk about them. So just be warned. Um, allow me for a moment to rearrange the book in such a way that I feel could have been more appropriate for this sequel and could have possibly left it open for a third book. Now, I don't actually want a third book, but there were a lot of things that happened in the second book that I felt could have been arranged and discussed and handled better that could have left it open for a third book because all of the content that is in book two feels like it could be two books worth of content. Split it up and you could have possibly made a third. So as I said in my review, I really enjoyed more the real world problems that was that were facing uh, Wade and his clan, uh, Samantha, his relationship between Samantha, between Gregarious Games, now that he owns it. I felt that the entire second book could have taken place entirely in the real world and could have addressed issues where Wade is trying to make the world a better place by, you know, feeding people, by using his billions of dollars to rebuild buildings. Uh, and instead of instead of basically copying the same formula as the first book where you've got the oasis and you've got challenges and you're trying to reach an end goal, save that for the third book if you need to. And I'll get back to that. The second book could have still had could still have had a couple oasis. You know, they, they don't have to spend their entire time outside of the oasis, but I don't think the oasis should have been the main center um, discussion of this book. It could it would have been much more interesting in my eyes to see how Wade and his team handle being rich after not having really money at all during their lives. And it kind of shows during during the second book because he's willing to give away a billion dollars to someone who's who could give him the first clue to the the seven shards. Uh, a clue to find the first of the seven, right? That billion dollars, he I mean, he didn't even know what the end goal was at that point. And that billion dollars could have gone towards something, I guess, more appropriate. I mean, and 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 because he says it on camera and he's, you know, got like a legal like thing you have to sign, right? You don't you have no idea who you're gonna give that billion dollars to, you know? You could have you could have made fifty thousand, or you could have you you could have made it like fifty thousand dollars. A billion dollars is like life changing, life altering money that Wade doesn't really know how to spend. He was being, I think that he was just being careless with that money. More importantly, this whole second book, if you read between the lines, it could have been an amazing philosophical discussion between discussing um art of uh you know artificial intelligence as as the main goal whether ai is actually alive what this means for humanity the future of humanity there are so there's so much potential here that i feel that didn't get addressed and was just kind of squished together and and um and uh, careless, carelessly thrown together. With the discussion of AI, wouldn't that be great to read about something where of of having at least I like these types of discussions where you could you could make that uh, make Anorak you know go through a Turing test, which is basically testing an AI system to see if they're alive or not. I'll use an example from the movie Ex Machina, where that's that movie is entirely about artificial intelligence. You can have a computer that can beat a human in chess and knows all of the right moves in order to beat, say, the best chess player in the world. But that doesn't mean that the computer knows what chess is. It can make all the right moves, but it doesn't necessarily understand what it is. So a Turing test would test an artificial intelligence to see if they actually know what it is to be alive and, and if they can, you know, if they can pass that test then 
a true intelligence is actually born. So if you can make the entire book in the real world, a discussion about artificial intelligence, its implications, whether it's smart to have something like that, to, you know, to download your consciousness into a server somewhere. If those, if that consciousness can actually act to the same as, uh, as you are, if it's an identical copy, if you have that part of the book, if you also have the real world issues, the relationships between Wade and his friends and running, uh, you know, gregarious games, you can have all that. And then at the end of the second book, have them make the decision to release the ONI headset because the ONI headset like Anorek was already a problem. Halliday knew it and, and Og knew it. That's why Og created that sword in case he ever needed to be, uh, you know, just in case he ever had to come back and, and, you know, kill Anorak. So artificial intel- intelligence was already, you know, rumored to be a problem, at least within Gregarious games. Um, and by doing that, you can have this whole book to have this discussion and, and, uh, See, there were, see whether it's smart to release the ONI headset because up until up until that point, it's not like Anorak needed the ONI headset in order to become this all powerful guy. It gave him access to more like real world, you know, military guns and and kind of almost like taking the real world hostage because he was able to control, uh, like you know, mechanical things in the real world from the Oasis. But he didn't really need the ONI headset. So the real, the only real, um drawback of having the ONI headset or the, the only real purpose of releasing it that early in, in book terms is because then that gives the plot a little bit more momentum for that 12 hour time period where, where, uh, where if, if you're stuck in the Oasis for, for more than 12 hours, then you can suffer brain damage, but being stuck inside of the Oasis and not coming and not being able to come back into real life is scary enough right? You don't need that 12 hour time limit. So you could, you could get rid of that. But, um, what Halliday could have done to, to further my plot point, I guess, is put a timer on the ONI headset and said to Wade, you know, this is a controversial, this is a controversial piece of equipment Test it out for yourself. But once you do that, a timer is going to start so that you can't release this. This technology is not going to work for a year, say, so that when he say like he and his team use it, they can use that year to discuss the implications of rele- of releasing such a headset to the public. Is it smart for us to create an artificial intelligence? Is this actually bettering humanity or is it just going to make us more money, which in the book, it makes them more money. And that was primarily their, at least Wade's uh, intention of releasing it. it was to, you know, was to make more money. But if Halliday had put a timer on the, the headset, it could have used that entire second book as the year process to say, all right, let's try to make humanity better. What are, what are, or have like a test group and say, what are the psychological impacts of having such a headset? Because they, one of the things that Samantha was worried about was creating an even more addictive piece of technology that even more addict, even more addictive than the Oasis already was. And you can go through all these tests to see whether releasing the ONI headset is best for humanity. Now they still could have released it at the end of the second book, but make that the ending to where, all right, we're releasing it. And then like the last 50 pages, you know what, Wade, there's uh, you know, we've been having some problems. It looks like some of this AI is, you know, going bad. You can make the whole book, a discussion with Anorak about artificial intelligence, what, what's good for humanity with, you know, releasing this headset. And then at the end of the second book, 
you can have him be like, you know what? I am smart because I out, I outsmarted you guys. I, I made you think that I could have been good for humanity, but here's, you know, here's the reality. I want this and I want this and I'm doing this for like selfish reasons. And then you could have had the entire third book. If it were to exist, you can have the third book, the challenges where they're trying to battle Anorak and save humanity, right? Give some, give the reader something to look forward to, because if you have the entire second book, not in the Oasis, and if people loved the Oasis part, you could make the third book. All right, now we're back in the Oasis and now we've got to fight crime and fight, you know, all the bad guys back in the Oasis again. Um, that, that to me could have, could have opened it up for a possible trilogy because then in the third book you could have expanded challenges right? All of these issues that I've just talked about, along with doing challenges where it's like seven, you have to find seven different shards. So then you have to do seven different challenges. It just feels really compressed, really squished together when all of these elements really need to be expanded upon. I love those types of intellectual conversations about life and, um, relationships between people and just the overall positive or negative consequences of, of everything that's happened in this book. And I just feel like, you know, the book was only was maybe like 350 pages. You could have had 350 pages of all the real world issues. And then you could have had 350 pages of, of Oasis stuff. I just feel like it could have been split up, which brings me to the whole plot point of Wade the whole spaceship searching for a new star thing where they're going to put all of human consciousness onto a server called the Arcadia, which is like an Oasis clone, I suppose bringing human embryos or uh, I I think human embryos on the ship to search for a new star so that humanity can continue its survival, not on earth in case earth ever just, fails, right? I've done a lot of research reading and over movie movies that I've seen and podcasts and books that I've read and just research in general to know that what they're trying to attempt it's too minimal. It's too minimal for what they what they currently have. And Klein is very into his details about all of the 80s trivia that 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 he has to research and all the characters have to use but we didn't get enough detail on the actual survival of the human race and I'll tell you what I mean the nearest star to us would take us thousands of years to get there at cur- current speeds that we can currently uh, generate thousands of years which means that you need generation ships Meaning my great, great grandkids might not even be able to see this planet that we're headed towards. So you need spaceships that can, that can sustain human life for thousands of years, because whoever starts that journey is not going to see the planet that they're, that they're ending up on. It's their, it's their ancestors that are going to get there. But the way that they describe the ship, it, it sounds like it's real small and I'm, they're not sending real people, but you still need, let's say, like engineers in case the ship fails, um, you know, ways to keep the embryos of, of real humans alive for thousands of years, people to maintain the Arcadia servers, right? And they only sent one ship. You need hundreds, if not thousands of ships aimed at every star that could possibly be uh, nearby because you really don't have any way of um, knowing whether they succeeded or not. So the best option is to shoot off as many as you can and hope that at least one of them makes it. Now, this is the type of thing that eventually humanity is going to have to uh, discuss. And this is a real problem that, that will face us in 
billions of years, possibly, because in, in four billion years, our own sun is going to burn out and take us with it. But this just not, it didn't feel like it was appropriate for this book. You don't really need to send this artificial intelligence out into different planets just yet, at least in the second book. You can save all that for the third book, but like I mentioned earlier, have an entire book discussing this stuff and leading up to it. Because, Aner- like, for example, Anorak as, as a villain felt very clumsily just put in without taking the time to discuss what artificial intelligence really means for this group of characters. They like Anorak just came out of nowhere and they're like, oh, it's an artificial intelligence. So, you know, better, better do what he says. If you want to make artificial intelligence your villain, it's not that original. But if you're going to do that, lead up to it a little bit more. Make us feel that heavy weight of the consequences of what they've done rather than just something just springing out especially when there was no mention of it in the first book. Second book, oh yeah, we always knew that Anorak might have been a problem. Like, oh really? Maybe you could have mentioned that in the first book, that that something like that could have happened. But as I'm remembering it, I don't remember this in the book, but some maybe someone can correct me, but I do remember in the movie, the movie came out in 2018, and if just from what I've read, Ready Player Two book sequel was announced in 2015. So, Whoever made, or uh, Steven Spielberg made the 2018 movie, so probably had some knowledge of of the direction that Ernest Klein was going. And I rem- now and then, then I'm remembering, I remember a very specific line. It's at the very end when Wade won the contest and he's in um, Halliday's room and Hall- adult Halliday and the young Halliday are walking away through the door. And Wade Wade says to him something, something like, who are you? You're not, you're not really a simulation, are you? And the kind of, and Halliday kind of looks over at him and he says, no. And Wade goes, well, what are you then? And he just walks away. That gave us a clue as to, well, you're not a simulation. You're an actual consciousness that Halliday has uploaded. And it was, I'm just me. It's, it just seems it's that it's positive that since they had knowledge of where Ready Player Two was going, they could put that line in there because then it leaves it open for artificial intelligence in the second book. But I don't remember a line like that at all in the first book. So that's just something that I remembered. And if you're going to preserve the entire human race, or at least everyone that's used an ONI headset, if you're going to preserve them inside of the Arcadia, or bring them out piece by piece because I don't think everybody was just all of a sudden in the Arcadia. I think they were doing it in small amounts or however they felt it was necessary. Brings up a lot of interesting questions, like even criminals. I'm sure criminals, some point in this book, have used an ONI headset, so now their consciousness gets downloaded too. Are you going to keep those types of people that could be harmful to society? And now you've got criminal um criminal uh consciousness in a in software that isn't bound by f- physical body and they're immortal they don't die at least they never alluded to that so they're they're saying well they're worried about i forget who it was but someone said well what if another like anorak event happens where one of them goes rogue and they go oh no that was just a weird software glitch that can't happen but Hate to break it to you, but people were terrible before Anorak was introduced. Okay. Anorak is not like the first guy, the first example of humans being terrible towards each other. Now you want to upload criminal um, consciousness into there so that they can wreak havoc for all time. Apparently there's no mention of software of, of like say an avatar getting deleted Um Let's say these criminals found out a way to, I don't know, take a bunch of hostages. Now they're, it's, they're in software and they may not be able to get out. They're not restrained by physical laws. It's all computerized. It's all like made up. It could be very potentially dangerous for these criminals' minds to be, you know, uploaded into, into this um, 
Arcadia. Um, and, you know, and there was no, I guess there was no real pain involved in, um, so I don't know if any real harm could be done, you know, inside of the Oasis using the ONI headset, but you've got the mindset of say like a serial killer downloaded into software and he might find different outlets to get that type of, uh, you know, action out. He may, he may not be able to kill anyone, but he might have that type of mindset, um, and use it in, and, you know, in other ways. And again, this could be a type of conversation that could have been discussed in a third book because then it opens up a dialogue of, okay, do they, does this Oasis have a government? Are there police? Is there social structure and hierarchy? Or is everyone just, you can't, it, the, the way they made it seem was it was just this grand, uh, you know, it was just like, like, a um, like a utopia all of a sudden in Arcadia. But if you're downloading the consciousness of, of, of human minds into software, all the same problems, especially if it's an exact copy, all the same problems from those people that were downloaded are going to be in the, uh, in the Oasis mental health, what is that like for software? Does software do, does the software like get depressed? Do they get anxious? Do they have high blood pressure? You know, like these these types of effects. It's it's interesting, and and if you don't want criminals in the consciousness of criminals in the oasis, how do you filter out the ones that are accepted? Because like, oh yeah, you were a serial killer in real life, but you can't actually kill anyone in here. So are you still able to? you know, make that manifest in a different way where you, I don't know, try to try to harm someone, you know, like these types of questions, this is a very gray area of where do you draw the line between who you allow to be in the simulation and um, who you don't allow to be in the simulation? Because there's, there's billions of people. How can you check every single, every single person? It, they're, they're, you know, you know what I mean? Like all these things I'm trying to think about that could have been, that could have made, Ready Player Two and Ready Player Three, a, a much more rich and diverse conversation between humans, between humans, and between humans and um, you know artificial intelligence. So a few other comments that I had. I feel like Sorrento being announced that he broke out of jail was clearly done for shock value. He makes two appearances within the entire book, both of them really unimportant, and he only. The the first appearance was him, you know, walking out of prison all happily because Anorak released him. And then the, and then the second appearance was when, um, uh, you know, toward, or maybe there was three, I don't know, but every, every appearance that he does make is just really not important. And when I first read that, I was like, please do not let Sorrento be the villain again. That would be so cheesy and so lazy. I'm glad that it didn't, but Sorrento didn't need to be in this book at all. He didn't really serve a real purpose. He kind of had a purpose at the end with, I forget the explanation, the explanation, but like him helping Anorak make sure stuff was happening in the real world or something. But like, you don't need Sorrento. I think you could have used literally anybody D doing that was just a shock value. And, and if that's one, th uh, one other thing that I, that I really dislike about what authors do is like, throwing in misleading information and miss and, and shock value type stuff. The first one, the first thing that I don't like is when authors bring characters back to life after they died. The second one being when characters swoop in at the last second, which is what I, I mentioned in my, in, in my ready player two review that happens a couple times in this, in this book where so it looks like someone's about to be killed or something. And then someone comes in and oh saves the day. Like, really predictable. And even in movies that sometimes it's appropriate. I don't always hate it, but I really dislike it a lot when that happens. And then I, I suppose the third one would be, would, would be doing this leading the reader or the, the, the movie viewer in, in such a direction, leading them in the wrong way so that they, um, you're, you're, you're misleading them on purpose just to mislead them and mainly doing it for shock value. And that's, that's something that I just, I just can't get behind. I also don't really buy the idea that Samantha fell in love with Wade again within the 12 hours of the challenge or of, of the challenge that they're doing. 
after not speaking to him for years and being angry and they still have differing opinions up until the, the last, you know, until they're doing that challenge and she doesn't speak to H or Shoto and doesn't really want any much to do with gregarious games because of the ONI headset. And we're supposed to like, you don't talk to someone for years and you're, and we're expected to believe that they just fall in love again within a few hours. That felt really forced. And a lot of my issues seem to be coming from this 12 hour time limit, the 12 hour time, the 12 hour time limit, uh, limits the, the, the challenges. So you've got to do, let's say seven, right? You got to do, was that like almost like one per hour or, or I can't do the math right now, but you know, one per hour ish and plan ahead for these challenges and being able to actually the amount of time that it takes to complete these challenges, everything within this 12 hour time frame that Anarik has given Wade and just that exists, like I've said many times before, just makes the book feel rushed. And if you didn't have that 12 hour time period, people being stuck in the in, inside of the Oasis and not being able to get back to the real world is, in my mind, scary enough. So you can expand upon these ideas and, and do everything that you would have done in Ready Player Two, but not have that that 12 hour limitation. And you could have expanded all these ideas throughout uh, Ready Player Two and possibly a third book. And having seven challenges really made the book drag because this is what felt like, this is what the each challenge felt like. All right, let's go figure out this first challenge. Hmm. Oh yeah, I'm an expert, so here's how we get there. Okay, great. Let's go defeat this challenge. Yay, we defeated it. Now let's go repeat the process six more times. That drags. But thank goodness that most of them weren't like the John Hughes movie sequence and the the, the planet where they had to go battle Prince because my, my body was like physically anxious for those sections to be, to, to be over. Luckily, the other ones were more adequate and those those two I just didn't like at all. So I gave the book a three out of five in my review. I don't want a third book, but these are just my thoughts on everything that I was thinking about while I was reading this on how it could have gone differently. And of course it's always easier in hindsight to correct a book once it's out and, and nitpick things and and speculate on would have gone better would have what could have gone better, but I just felt like I had to get these thoughts out. Let me know if you guys agree with me. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next book review video. See you later.